Yeah. 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 Hello and welcome to the Better Reading Book Club. Uh, we've got uh, a fabulous lineup of guests today. We've got Beverly Cousins from Penguin Random House. Beverly is actually the publisher of the book that we're talking about tonight. And we've got Candace Fox, who's actually a writer, a crime, would you say that? A crime writer. Mm -hmm. She's written how many books? Four? Oh, uh, I've written three of my own and then a couple with James oh, yes. Patterson. Right. <laughs> anyway, it just goes on and on and on. Yeah. But let's, we'll get to the point and we'll come back to Candace Fox yeah. and we'll come back to Bef Beverly. But tonight we're actually talking about The Light Between Oceans by M.L. Stedman. Um, where t the book was actually published four years ago, is that right? 2012. Yeah, 2012. Mm -hmm. But it's coming out as a movie uh, in the next couple of weeks and it's starring... Michael Fassbender, yes, and Alicia Vikander, and Alicia Vikander. Now, who fell in love? <laughs> Is that oh, true? Yeah, really. Ah, there you go. Cute. So we're talking about the light between oceans. We're taking comments. We're taking questions. So please keep um, stay with us. But also too, we're actually giving away this evening. We are giving away five double passes to see the movie. So the double passes will go to people that we, th well, to the questions or comments that we think are the most interesting. So join the conversation. So Cheryl Arkell from Better Reading, I'm with Beverly Cousins and I'm with Candace Fox. The Light Between Oceans. Now I'm just, if you don't mind Beverly, I'd just like to set the tone here because this is a book that I have absolutely adored. Uh, four years ago, or probably a bit earlier, I had a coffee with Beverly Cousins and <laughs> Beverly uh, told me that she had this wonderful manuscript. It was written by a woman called M.L. Stedman and I should read it. So when I first read this book, it was actually in manuscript form mm. and I absolutely just couldn't put it down. So I'm going, to, I'm going to set the tone here. So there are spoilers tonight. We're assuming you've read the book and if you haven't, that's fine. Stay with us and go back and read the book or go back and see the movie. So let me set the scene. The Light Between Oceans is about a couple called Tom and Isabel. It's post-World War I, 1926. It's set in Western Australia in a lighthouse on Janus Rock. Now what happens is Isabel, uh, so they're a newlywed couple, they're posted at the lighthouse and Isabel has a, a couple of pregnancies and stillbirths that you know, are terrible and traumatic to her. And so it's really, they're very tough scenes and they're very well written. But one day, a dinghy comes to shore, it's washed up on the lighthouse, and there is a live baby girl in that dinghy and a dead body. And it is the story of how Tom and Isabel deal with that. What do they do with the baby? What do they do with a dead man? And these are the issues that come through in the book. Now, I found it an emotional roller coaster mm. in terms of it being a page turner. Mm. I could not put it down. Mm. And even though I first read it four years ago, I still think about the dilemma of mm. this couple. So over to you, Beverly Cousins. Tell me, why is it? A, a little bit about publishing and a little bit about acquiring. So Beverly's worked with Random, Penguin Random House for some years and she is a publisher of fiction. And so a lot of the great fiction you're reading at the moment is because of Beverly. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, she actually, she, she is always looking for a good story and a good story to publish. So what Candace. caught your eye? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Candace, she yes, She has of excellent taste. <laughs> she does indeed because she, she publishes Candace. Yeah. So Beverly, tell us firstly how this wonderful story came to you. Well, it was just, it, it was fantastic. It, because M.L. Stedman, um, she's Australian, but she lives in London and she had a London agent. So in fact, it was actually sent out to UK publishers and Australian publishers jointly. Mm -hmm. And so there were nine publishers involved, all, all told. And Everybody I, wanted it. Everybody wanted it. Mm -hmm. And um, so I went, we bought it jointly. We pitched jointly with my UK colleagues, Transworld. Um, they were lucky they had to do the pitch to, to um, the author in person. And then I had to do a very long phone conversation with her, which was, I think it was about... 
So you one were one o'clock in the morning. You were auditioned. You did. You had, she was. Yeah. She was speaking to everybody because it was very important to her that she got the right publisher who really understood. And I think that is very, very important in terms of matching publishers with writers. And we can talk about that at a later time. That's my dog George, <laughs> and he ain't very happy <laughs> over there. But um, I think the relationship between uh, writers and publishers is really crucial. And mm. often I hear authors talk about the relationship bet- uh, between you know their publisher or their editor. Mm. Uh, in in that's what they're referred to in the UK mm. and the US. And I think that that's a crucial relationship, well, isn't it? She, she definitely You've got to be on the me. same page. She definitely auditioned me. And, mm. and I was on the phone, I think it was one o'clock in the morning, you know, I was in my kitchen trying to keep my voice down because my kids were in bed, you know, and literally she, she grilled me. Uh, and thankfully after all of that and all the competition that Transworld and Random House Australia you got the book. It. Which Yay! Is <laughs> well, we're very lucky. We're very lucky to have it. And we're very lucky that it's you know, in a, such a short period of time, is coming out as a film. So if you've just joined us, Cheryl Arkell from Better Reading, I'm talking to Beverly Cousins and Candace Fox, and we are talking about The Light Between Oceans by M.L. Stedman. The movie's coming out, and we're giving away some movie tickets. Now, Candace, tell mm. me, mm-hmm. what did you think of the book? Well, I... Oh, firstly, tell me how you read it. Did you read it oh. in print? Oh, no. I um, I have been running around madly trying to write my own novels. Uh, so I actually listened to it on audiobook. Um, I listened to it audiobooks while I'm running mm-hmm. uh, and doing the housework and things like that. Um, it was fantastic. It was really well done. I think that the narrator's name is Noah Taylor. Um, and he wasn't too hard on trying to get all the different voices. I mean, he has a huge cast to deal with. There are so many different characters, and um, it was great. It was really heart wrenching. It was know. really hard. I I thought every page. It's like in a in a way. I thought even though there is suspense in it, I thought every page was like a thriller. Like mm-hmm. you know that yeah. I was racing through. Did you feel? I that? I was I was just walking for the last bit of it because I'd done a run and I was making all these facial expressions and I, I could feel myself doing, doing them, going, oh, oh, no, oh, she didn't, you know, and all yeah. this while I was walking along. Yeah. And people would, okay, so did you find yourself judging the characters for their actions? So Yeah. So they yeah. they actually <clears throat> decide to keep the baby. Well, Isabel decides to keep the baby and Tom is, is kind of torn about that. Um, but Isabel decides to keep it, and I absolutely can see where she's coming mm. from. Yeah. So, did you did you find yourself judging? Yeah, because I. I and knew, whose side were you on? Uh, ooh, I knew that they kept the baby. Um, or I was very interested to see who led that decision. Um, you know, and I could understand where it's coming from for yeah. sure. Because when she's having those miscarriages, mm. you just. And she has a stillbirth at one point, all by herself. Yeah, isn't she? yeah, yeah. Terrible. So agonizing. Two weeks, only two her. weeks before the actual mm-hmm. baby washes up. Right. Yeah. I, I wondered about her desperation to have a baby, though. I mean, it's not as though she went out to the island, um, you know, expressing that like I cannot wait to have a baby or having a baby. You know, it's after she's had those traumatic mm. um, miscarriages that she sort of finds that need. I think. Yeah. Would you agree? I expect also the fact that she's on this isolated island. She's got nothing very nothing. much to do, and so mm. I think the focus all becomes part of the. You know, this is what she needs to have. She needs to have a, a baby and something to nurture and look after. And I, I've always been on Isabel's side. And, and when we first published it we had a book club at, at Random House and we all talked about it and I was it was the first time I realized how many people had different opinions of her and yeah. and how everyone judged her in different ways or liked her because I was very much on her side oh I'm definitely on her and, side uh, yeah. I love Tom I, I yeah. fell in love with Tom yeah. everyone fell in love with yeah, Tom but did. with Isabel it became far more contentious about people's reactions to it's her. so sad she says um, after one of the losses it must be something that's wrong with me or mm. it's mm. my fault or something and you just mm. think oh my god Mm. It's heart wrenching, isn't yeah. it? I mean, so what happens is that she, they do decide to keep the baby, and they call her Lucy. Lucy, Lucy. Um, but very often Tom and Isabel leave uh, Janice Rock, and they go into the town. And after a while, they discover that there is a grieving mother out there who thinks that her child is dead. And uh, they soon put two and two together and realise that that's Lucy. So the moral dilemma that they're in is absolutely extraordinary. Mm. And my heart bled for all Mm. of them, Mm -hmm. for the grieving mother, for Isabel, for Tom, for all of them. So in terms of the moral question, what do you think? 
Well, I think what, what I loved about the novel was the fact that there were so many, um, were they right to do this? Yeah. And it wasn't just, was Isabel right to want to keep the baby? And was Tom right to, to go along with it? It was also, was Tom right to kind of shot them? Because it's because of him that, that in the, the end they are found out. Yeah. Um, in fact, even though it sounds awful, is the real mother, Hannah, is she right to want the baby back, you know, mm. as well? And, and then, again, at the end, when Isabel actually has to choose between the baby and Tom, is she right in the choice she makes? You know, there were mm. all these questions, and I think that's what you mean about the roller coaster, that every time you think mm. you're, you've kind of almost got a handle mm. on it, something else comes and pulls it out from mm. under you. Mm. If, if the decision would have been made much more complex as well <laughs> by the fact that Hannah had never given up on the idea that the baby or her husband might still be alive. I mean, she was still walking along the beaches mm -hmm. and visiting the police station and mm -hmm. writing. And searching for it, as you would. Yeah. yeah if yeah. she had given up and mourned the baby and gotten over it and then maybe had another child or something or remarried, yeah. it, it would have been just that slight bit easier, the decision, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it's harder again for that reason. Now, we're... Just excuse me a minute, I'll just say we're actually, it's Better Reading Book Club. Thank you for joining us. I'm Cheryl Arkell. I'm talking to Candice Fox and Beverly Cousins. And we're talking about The Light Between Oceans, which is now coming out as a movie. And we're giving away some film tickets. So please make some comments, ask some questions. I think we have some questions. Yeah. Alyssa wants to know if all of you found it believable. There was one part that I didn't, and that's when H Hannah comes back and says, um, you can have the baby, you, you know, you can have Lucy as long as I mm. know that it was all Tom's fault. I oh, thought there's really? no way. I love no that bit. Way. Oh, really? <laughs> but to me, that was her making the ultimate... The, the, Sacrifice, It's, it's yeah. um, when, when Lucy disappears, or Lucy Grace, as, she, as she's known to Hannah. Because she's called Grace by her mother, and uh, Lucy... It, uh, by Tom and Isabel. Isabel. Yeah. And she disappears when they go back on and she's actually reunited with her mother but she doesn't settle with her mother um, because obviously she doesn't see her as her mother, she sees Isabel as her mother. Mm. So how old is she by then? She's about four. She's almost four. four. Yeah. 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 And she actually runs away, she tries to run back and it's at that moment, this is a spoiler so I hope this is okay. Yes, that's fine. She, this is, it's that, it's at that moment to me where all the characters suddenly realise it's not about them, it's about her. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's when Hannah says, I just can't do this to my daughter anymore. I'm going to have to give her up. And so that, to me, that was such a poignant moment yeah. that she's actually prepared to sort of say... I, I thought she was going to propose, like, co-parenting. Like, I will yeah. deal with I you. thought about co-parenting. Yeah. I thought, like, you know, when parents divorce, so, you know, one week on and one week off. But we are talking about 1926, aren't mm. we? So yeah. things might have been a little bit mm. differently. Yeah. We're going to take another question or comment. This is Better Reading Book Club. I'm Cheryl Arkell. We're talking to Beverly Cousins and we're talking to Candace Fox. If you've got any questions or comments... Uh, fire away and we are going to give away some movie tickets tonight for the best question or best question or comments. Now we've got another one. Uh, Lorraine says the harshness of the landscape is really well depicted. What did the panel think of the way the author describes Janice Rock and the land and yeah, I mean, I, I thought the sense of place was absolutely terrific mm -hmm. and I really felt the isolation and mm -hmm. I felt that the decisions were being made against the landscape, that it actually, ref in a way, it was instrumental to, to some of the decisions that they made. Well, I think it's just that isolation and the fact that they became it became their world. Yeah. So they made this decision that they would keep the baby because it was very easy for them to forget that there was this world outside. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it was just their world and, and, and they must have been so dependent on each other because they he would have wanted to keep her happy and it, you know, they would have to sort of act together as a couple yeah. and that's all to do with this isolation and of course I did remember that Janice the, the lighthouse is on Janice Rock Janice is the Roman god with two faces and so it was all this sort of very much oh, right. the, everything yeah, is this jewel is it right, yeah. is it wrong and, oh, uh, right. when you wrote down Janice earlier I thought oh, I remember that I remember. Yeah. <laughs> Now we've got some um, comments uh, from uh, some of the, the better reading readers, Bianca. She thinks Tom is one of the most wholesome male characters ever created. Yeah. Carly seconds this, saying, oh, this book broke my heart. Such a wonderful, wholesome man doing his best. I know. I mean, we all fell in love with Tom, didn't we? Yeah. We did fall in love with Tom. sweetie. He was a sweetie. Okay, Rhonda says she found it to be a reflection of the challenges of childless couples and the lengths to which they might go to to have a family. That's interesting, isn't it? Mm. Do you think? Yeah. 
Yeah, on that one, I think it's just, for me, it wasn't so much a childless couple as just this, this situation that they were in. And, mm. and, and for her as well, for, for Isabel, it was very much, after all she'd been through, God had handed her this. You know, it, was, yeah, it wasn't, it was too it was, much of a coincidence that yeah, this was meant to happen. Mm. So I didn't actually sort of see it so much as, as what childless couples But if they had been, had they been, you know, a couple with children or a couple with grown-up kids or no, you know, then I think the story would have been entirely different. Mm. So it yeah. had some bearing mm. on the decisions that they mm. made. I mean, she was yearning for a child mm. and biologically True. she was probably, yeah. her hormones oh. were going mental mm. um, and I uh, she why made they, those decisions. why they never discussed um, taking a child from an orphanage because they did, you know, Isabel would say how awful orphanages were. I wonder if they, if the baby hadn't shown up you know planted in their lap if that would have come to them eventually if they would have considered that I think they're worried or Isabel certainly says at one point if we if we take her back to the mainland and she'll be put in an orphanage and they'll never let us adopt her yeah because we live on our own on an oh, island yeah, just true, the two true, of us. True, true. yeah she didn't think that they yeah, so, were yeah. eligible yeah. and also we are talking about post 1920 you know 1926 yeah. mm. we've got some some more comments here um Rhonda says she found it on reflection Oh, I've just read that. Um, mm -hmm. On the ending, sad, but the ending was the right one. Karen disagrees, saying the ending really did nothing for me and left me wanting answers. Mm -hmm. Okay, can we just have a summary of the ending so that people know what we're talking about? So in the end, um, oh, I've got to remember it now, it's four years ago. <laughs> well, so um, in the end, she, because um, Tom is in prison, because yes. he's taken all the full responsibility for it, even though it was Isabel's. Really, Isabel drove it. Tom takes all the responsibility, um, and right up until quite near the end, Isabel is letting him do that. And then she finally does yes. um, tell the truth, and Tom and Isabel are finally reunited. Um, the baby goes back to the real mother, and then it moves forward to 1950, um, when Isabel and Tom have obviously lived together. They've stayed married, um, and their marriage has survived. Yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. then. Uh, a grown woman comes to visit them, or comes to visit Tom. Yeah. I've, now, the you, mother has passed away, though, hasn't mm -hmm. she, from cancer mm -hmm. just a week earlier. Um, I thought I saw the ending coming. I thought that Lucy was going to die when she went off in the middle of the mm -hmm. night to find a lighthouse, and I thought, I can see this coming, and that's going to be a really good ending, mm -hmm. because... It's, it's, it would have been all these people fighting over her and then they've just broken her, you know, mm. like a doll. Um, mm. But I was, I was satisfied with the ending. Um, I, I, I would have liked to have seen Isabel alive just at the end to mm. see her come back. I think mm. that would have been mm. so nice. Mm. So it was sort mm. of a bittersweet ending. I loved the ending to see Tom 20 years on mm. and how he's mm. still devoted to Isabel and yeah. he nursed her to the end and mm. then he kind of gets a reward at the end when... Yeah. Well, that's why we fall in love with Tom so yeah. much. You're at Better Reading Book Club. Um, thank you for joining us. If you have any questions or comments, we are talking about The Light Between Oceans by M.L. Stedman. I'm with Beverly Cousins and Candace Fox and we have a question. Susan asks, do you think Tom's experiences as a soldier impacted his decisions throughout the novel? I think so. Mm. I think that as a soldier, you're making decisions all the time and probably not based on uh, emotion, but on, you know, absolute, uh, I guess, your, your own judgment of a situation. So he was probably better placed, I think. Um, his experience probably better placed him to make decisions, but also he wasn't the hormonal person at the time who, mm. even though he was there with her, he hadn't suffered the miscarriages and the stillbirths. Mm. Um, Might he have been in a position, you know, having survived the war and now he's met this wonderful woman, you know, he says that he felt like his life was over when he met Isabel and everything was going fantastic. You know, having been in the war, maybe he's thinking how lucky it is for this all to have happened and, and, and not sort of saying to himself, oh God must have dropped this baby on me, but mm -hmm. how lucky it is that mm -hmm. this baby has been dropped on me mm -hmm. at this time mm -hmm. you know maybe he felt a bit of gratitude for that um, gosh I love Tom mm. okay and of course he had a um, his mother left him when mm. when he was yes, a child true. so um, when I reread this just recently oh I remember this his, his mm. mother left him yeah it's mm. really it you know I mean it is a it, it's classified as commercial fiction but there is a lot of depth to it 
And ML was writing it for 10 years, wasn't she? So yes, yeah. there, there is a lot of research yeah. that's gone into this. Um, and I, I felt it read that way, like it read that she had done her research. Mm. It read beautifully. And I, I felt that she actually writes quite beautifully. Mm. We've got another comment. Uh, Julie asks what happened to the dead body. So should we talk some more about Frank as a character? Mm. Oh. Yes, well, um, so Frank um, was exhumed, wasn't he? And then yeah. given a proper burial. Yes. Mm. So yeah. they have, they bury him on the island, and that's the problem. Is when they when they actually get to the island and the police come to the island and take um, them all off, um, and they they do exhume his his body. And then of course Tom is being accused of did he actually murder? Um, oh, that's Frank. right. Yeah. That's so right. it's not just a case of have they taken a child? It's did they actually it's kill a, the man in yeah. order to keep the child? And that's why he's he's really in prison and why Isabel isn't at, at first. She doesn't help him. She doesn't say that no, the, the body was already dead when it was washed up. Frank mm. seems to have been a nice guy as well mm. too, you know, optimistic and bright and yeah. happy despite what he'd been through. So yeah. in a way it's interesting to see that him and Tom might have had some similarities. Mm. Yeah, that's mm. right. Yeah. We're talking about The Light Between Oceans by M.L. Stedman. Um, it's a fabulous book. It's been out for four years. Uh, it's, a, it's a moral roller coaster in a sense is how you mm. describe the genre, if there is such a genre. Um, but the movie's coming out very shortly. We're giving away some movie tickets. If you'd like to make a comment, ask us a question, you could win a double pass to see the film. Now, we've got another comment. Right, on the movie, Janine asks if you think the actors chosen for the film suit the characters. Well, it turns Boy. out <laughs> that Bev has seen the film. Neither I of us I haven't <laughs> seen the film yet. I'm going to go and see it shortly. What do you think, Bev? I thought they were perfect. I have to say, I mean... You know, I went into this into the movie. Everyone will say, "Oh, you're going to say it's it's wonderful," but actually, I went in quite nervous to see the movie because, you know, it could. I was worried it would overwrite. It's, it's like your baby too. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you've imagined these characters in your head, and then my ner my nervousness was that the seeing Michael Fassbender and Lisa Vikander and Rachel Weisz would actually overwrite my uh, in a bad way, you know. Mm. And and they were wonderful. The whole cast I thought was amazing. Even the little girl that plays Lucy oh. is just wonderful but I have to say for me Alicia Vikander who played Isabel was a complete standout I mean I think it's actually wow. really hard to cast that character because she's so you love her you hate her you know she has to embody so many she's a very complex character mm. and she does it in a way she's she looks so beautiful and angelic but she's also got a steel to her as well in the novel mm. and in the film and she really I thought she just embodied Isabel and I have to say watching it you I, and I know the author, ML, said this as well, that when she watched it, it didn't feel like you were watching actors. They became her characters. So she enjoyed the film She as loved well. it, yeah. Oh, isn't yeah. that fantastic? Good. And you loved it? I loved it, yeah. Wow, there you go. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't very, that happen very often. Where You know, you love yeah. the book, the publisher of the book, and she's also loving the movie. So we're at Better Reading Book Club. Uh, I'm with Beverly Cousins, the publisher of... The Light Between Oceans, and I'm with Candace Fox, who's joined us this evening. We've got another... Um, Anne says it was interesting learning about their isolation and how they dealt with that through their relationship. How do we think isolation affected the characters and their loneliness? Yeah, do you know, I thought that about that a lot, actually, when I was reading it, because there is no way on earth I could go and live on a, mm. in a lighthouse and just I with my partner. I would love to. I thought <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> I thought I would love to live there with the goats and the chickens yeah. and things. I said right. it awesome yeah. to me. I yeah. just run around it. But I do, think, I do think being, like, had they been in, in a town or a city, mm. then their decision obviously oh, would have yeah. been very different. Yeah. So I think the isolation absolutely affected the decisions that they were, that, that they made. And that they can't see who they're hurting mm. in right. their decision. Mm. It's just the two of them. So as they keep the baby day by day and nothing changes, you know, yeah. that would have been, mm. you know, supporting their choice to have done that. I mean, the one scene that really stick, stuck in my mind was when they are back on the mainland for the first time and they are walking, I think they're walking to church, I'm not sure, they walk together and they start to hear the story about Hannah and this poor woman who lost her baby and her husband. Yeah, and you can know. almost feel, I feel like I'm sort of shivering and going white yeah. with yeah. them when they realise. It's the this christening, actually, I think, it's the christening yeah. where they learn. Right, yeah. 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 Um, we've, we have had some of our readers who have sent us comments um, and they didn't like it. Jill says, my God, 
I must be seriously out of touch if this is considered a good book. <laughs> Although the section on the island is well done, the rest of it is irritatingly implausible. So thanks, Jill, for your comment, but I don't agree. <laughs> Fiona says, I found this book desperately sad, pointless and upsetting. Please don't read it unless you're feeling emotionally strong. <laughs> That's kind of, you know, she it's obviously moved her, mm. but she found it. It is mm. desperately sad, mm. but do read it. Be mm. If you haven't read it, do read it because... It's okay to feel sad sometimes. It is. It, it is. is. So, I mean, it is a sad movie as well, it I is. will say, and, and the end of the book and at the end of the movie. But you also feel... It's a nice ending. I actually mm. found, I mean, I welled up with the ending because it was just so nice. It was about forgiveness and reconciliation. And mm. I actually felt that it had, um, you know, a wonderful uplifting beat to it at mm. the end. Mm. Mm. Lynette said she too listened to it on audio and disliked it enough to ask for a <gasps> refund. Oh, my oh, oh that's cruel. Wow. She didn't listen to the right Do one. You know, it was the wrong cassette, I think. <laughs> Do you know, I, I read Lynette's comment the other day because she posted it on one of the posts. And I, I, it posed an interesting question for me. Is I mean, I read so many books and I like some and I don't like others, but do I ever expect a refund? If I don't like it, oh, yeah. I thought that was a very interesting yeah, do you, comment. Is that a, but, you is know, that a legitimate I mean, reason? what do you think? Do you expect a refund when you don't like the book that you've read? Love to hear comments on yes. that as well. We've got a comment. Uh, yeah, hold on a second. Cody says there were so many elements to the book. Loss and resilience were the ones that shone through for me. Without what were the a doubt. That shone through to you? Yeah, loss and resilience, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, well, I suppose nature and nurture and family and the yes, role of family yes. and also duty and love you know yeah. and how they sort of you know clash mm. sometimes. but yeah. also the resilience of the couple and the family mm. unit I mean mm. you know that, that they actually stayed together and even though they had completely mm. differing mm. views yeah I mean he was such a solid rock that time I love oh, him I love him too I really <laughs> love him I just so loved him <laughs> yeah. now listen I also want to talk about um the fact that this so it's been out for four years we're talking about The Light Between Oceans by M.L. Stedman it's coming out as a movie shortly but four years ago because of Beverly Cousins, it came out as a you know a regular fiction release. It probably went to the top ten very quickly, mm -hmm. didn't it, uh, and became a bestseller uh, quite quickly. But also for us at Better Reading, we we run a voting. We ask Australians to vote for their top. 100 books every year and you know this twice yeah. so, so we've run yeah. the vote twice and twice the light between oceans has appeared on the list mm. so i know that there are some people that don't like it but i think most of the population do like it i mean it's now if i can boast it is now in 40 different countries 40 right. different you translations. can boast wow. yeah you can and boast. it's sold over two million copies there you go worldwide. there you Fantastic. go mm. And well, it's an Australian book. And it's it an Australian, Australian book, <laughs> and it's good. by an Australian yeah. writer. Mm. So if you want to see the movie, uh, ask us a question or make a comment and we'll take it. But while we're here, I just want to ask um, Candice. Mm. Candice um, Fox is a writer, a young writer, as you can see. She's mm. written crime fiction, also published by Beverly Cousins. Uh, her, first, her first book was Hades. Um, she has been described as one of Beauty the others. greatest crime writers of our time oh, now i am going to say <laughs> this it is actually true she is i am hearing a lot of accolade about uh, this book it's very nice. um she has also let's just put this up she has also co-written a book with james patterson mm -hmm. now that doesn't happen very often so for those of you that are writers out there and aspiring <laughs> writers you'll know how amazing this is mm -hmm. now listen i've got a couple of questions for you candace because mm. a friend of mine Russell, he uh, is a big fan, mm -hmm. and he wanted to ask. He wanted me to ask you questions on his behalf. Sure, of course. Uh, so, is there a TV series coming out for? Yes. Uh, well, they're in the pipeline. So, um, I have sold the rights to um, the Bennett Archer series, which is these three: Hades, Eden, and Fall. Wow. Um, they have been sold within Australia. So, they are a series. Do you read them quite? A in, in order? Yes, so Hades first, um, yeah. Eden second and um, uh, Fall third. Uh, yeah. But my next novel, Crimson Lake, which comes out in February, I've sold the rights to that as well to a different company. Um, Essential Media, they do... Um, oh, I know Essential Media. Yeah, yeah. Rake and Jess. And they're just, yeah, yeah they're not far yeah. from the, our office. Yeah, yeah. so um, they have been bought, so they're in the pipeline. I think um, somebody, they hired a writer for one of them the other day. So. Okay, so they are going to be made into a TV series. Mm. And how you came up with the character, Hades Archer? 
So Hades Archer um, is an ex-criminal overlord. Um, he buys a tip in his retirement and he will hide bodies in it for a fee, um, which is an interesting retirement plan for him. Um, so I was living in Queensland and we lived sort of in the rainforest and we didn't have any garbage collection and there was a sort of a makeshift tip near us run by this sort of grisly character. Um, and I sort of started from there. I think about disposing of bodies a lot. And I thought well, that that was it's just... not what I think about a lot, but that's okay. Yeah, it's, my line you don't work. look like that you Cheryl think about McCann this. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Just, I'm going to lock my doors tonight. Don't you worry. Time, yeah. Yeah. Now, listen, how did, how did this marriage happen? How did you find Beverly? Or how did Beverly find you? Well, my agent um, took Hades to Bev. Right. Um, so uh, I don't know what that mm. moment was like when you read it for the first time. It was um, it was one of those, we don't have them that often. Publishers wish they had them more often where you, you start to read a novel. I had it with Light Between Oceans. I had it with Hades where you suddenly get that sort of tingle down your spine and you think, it's, this isn't just good, this is something I just have to publish. Mm, I have to publish yeah. it. And I remember it was just before Christmas. Yes, it was. And I made sure that I got my offering before Christmas. And I think some of the other publishers were saying, can we have until January? And I was going, no, you can't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so um, <laughs> Candice's agent uh, said yes to mine. Well, that's fantastic. We are very, very lucky to have Candice. Do we have another question or comment? Uh, a few of our readers are asking if ML Steadman has any more books on the way. Oh. She is writing. And I know nothing more than that. Okay. But I'm looking forward to it as much as anyone. Okay. So she, hopefully she'll have a book out soon. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I guess we've got to thank Beverly Cousins for, one, joining us tonight, but two, for bringing these fabulous books to us, not just The Light Between Oceans, for bringing us uh, Candace Fox, but many other books that you've actually I didn't write got. them, but I'll take the credit. <laughs> <laughs> no, you actually help the reader discover them, That's is right. what you do. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you so much for joining us oh, tonight. You've you. made such a valuable contribution, and congratulations. I mean, oh, you really, you. to... I mean, this is another show, but we will come back at some point and we will have a chat with Candace, a longer chat about how she actually got to be working with James Patterson. But anyway, that's for another episode. <laughs> this is Better Reading Book Club. I can't thank you enough for joining us tonight. Uh, next time, where is the 30th, of Wednesday the 30th of November. Remember, we are Book Club the last Wednesday of every month. And next month we are actually talking about graham norton yes the graham norton he's written a f i was going to give you my views on it but i won't not yet <laughs> it's called holden it, it is written by graham norton and we're going to be discussing it on the 30th of november but also we're actually calling for a live audience so if you want to join book club and come in and actually be with us and ask us questions live yourself Stay tuned, check out our website, check out our Facebook page and we'll tell you how you actually get, can be in the live audience because it will be fantastic. You could ask us questions direct. Okay, well thank you so much for both joining us. Holding by Graham Norton is our next book. Go and see the movie if you haven't. It's a light between the <laughs> oceans. <laughs> Beverly reckons it's as good as the book. Check it out. See you next time.